Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. I'm your host, Dara Albright, co-founder of G Wealth Education. First, I'd like to thank Clout for assembling today's all-star panel. And we will be talking about generating income for investment clients during these times of market volatility. Before I hand over the mic to today's moderator, Jason Manchalki, uh, who is the head of content at Cloud, I just have a couple of housekeeping items. First, this webinar will last one hour. There will be 50 minutes, 5-0, for the panel discussion and 10 minutes for Q&A. Q&A is typically reserved for the end of the presentation, but feel free to post questions as they come to you in the chat box to your right. Um, and, you know, feel free to weigh in even if you want to on the discussion. We just hope that once you post a, a question in that chat box, we ask if you could just use a question mark so we know that that is a question as opposed to a comment. And that'll help us when we get to those questions. Uh, this webinar also qualifies for one hour of CE credit, and that's towards the CIMA, CPWA, CIMC, RMA, and CFP certifications. If you haven't done so already, please make sure to provide us with your institute ID number so that we can make sure that you do get the CE credit for your participation. If you haven't done that already when you registered, you could email that information to ce at dwealth.education. And with that, I'm going to hand that over to you, Jay. Thanks so much, Dar. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jay Manchaki, Cloud by Tiffin's head of content and your moderator today. Very excited to be here to discuss how successful advisors and asset managers are indeed generating income for investment clients during these times of market volatility. Our webinar series in conjunction with Digital Wealth News brings together wealth management luminaries, technologists, and key operators for dynamic discussions and trends in the marketplace, and ultimately how advisors can benefit from them. But before we have our esteemed panelists introduce themselves, we welcome the interactivity in the webinar, the opportunity for you to ask questions, so please don't hesitate to do so. And then just a brief overview of what we'll cover today. We'll start out by talking about how investment managers and advisors are delivering income to their clients, whether that's through traditional approaches or alternative strategies. Next, we'll take a look at how these leaders are navigating market conditions and those risks we're taking and perhaps those worth avoiding. And then we'll transition to how clients are able to take comfort in the past, given the current geopolitical stability, instability. And finally, we'll wind down by talking about scenarios and outcomes for the anticipated Fed right hikes and what that looks like. Uh, including the, the balance sheet on wine. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the baton to our panelists to introduce themselves, starting with Maggie Jondro. Maggie. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. I am Maggie Jondro. I'm a financial advisor and managing partner of Jondro Wealth Management. Uh, we are a financial uh, advisory and investment management firm located in Connecticut with two locations one in Farmington and one in Westport, Connecticut. But we do service uh, clients across the United States um, proudly even prior to the pandemic. Uh, so we were able to transition uh, really easily since we had already been using Zoom. Uh, personally, uh, I um, uh, attended Providence College, then got my master's at the London School of Economics and I started my career on Wall Street. I was at Barclays and at JP Morgan prior to joining my mother-in-law uh, at John Dara Wealth Management and ultimately being her succession plan. We are proudly a woman-owned and operated firm, uh, which that does not mean we only work with women, but we certainly attract many women for that reason. And I think that's it. So I'll turn it on to my next uh, colleague. All right, Marcel. Good afternoon, my name is Marcel Benjamin. I'm a fixed income strategist with State Street Global Advisors and the Spider family of ETFs. Uh, I work with clients of all stripes, um, helping them get comfortable with fixed income investment strategies and our suite of 38 uh, bond ETFs in the US that total about $105 billion. Um, I've spent about 20 years in fixed income. I've worked for firms like BlackRock, Guggenheim Partners, and Swiss Re, and I've come at bonds from all angles, and I've been at uh, State Street now for about six years. Excellent. And Joe. Hi, I'm Joe Fennessy. I'm the founder and CEO of Finalized Capital. We're a quantitative commodity trading advisor, so a little bit different than the colleagues I'm with today. 
rather than doing long-term buy and hold investments in stocks and bonds and ETFs. Instead, we're doing short-term algorithmic trading in futures markets. That includes commodities, that also includes equity indices, interest rates, and currencies. So I hope to be able to offer a unique perspective at this webinar since I'm operating in a little bit of a different space than everyone else here. Excellent. And Ross. Hey, everybody. My name is Ross Frankenfield. Uh, I'm a managing director at uh, Harbor Capital Advisors, uh, where I've spent the last 16 years of my career. Uh, Harbor is a asset manager that uh, currently has about 60 billion in assets under management. Um, we cover a wide range of different asset classes and investment styles. Um, and then we deliver those solutions to clients in a variety of different vehicles, including mutual funds, collective investment trusts for the retirement community, uh, as well as exchange traded funds. And uh, we've actually uh, been launching several uh, ETFs over the last year, which we're very excited about. Um, Harbor is a little bit unique than uh, a lot of the asset managers that you may be used to working with and that rather than manage most of our strategies in house, uh, we go out and seek to identify and partner with world class asset managers across a wide range of asset classes and investment styles wherever they may reside across the globe. And then we seek to partner with them and then bring their solutions to the marketplace in those particular areas of expertise. Uh, and so in terms of my role at Harbor, uh, working on the investments team, um, I have the privilege of working very closely with a variety of our sub-advisory partners, but also with our clients. Uh, and we have the benefit of being able to synthesize a lot of these independent, uh, unique and often disparate views that our sub-advisors may have, and then share those insights with uh, the marketplace and our clients in a variety of different venues, including things like webinars, as well as just uh, typical one-on-one -on -one client meetings. And uh, very happy to be here. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, Ross. What a great cross-section of panelists we have representing different segments of the industry. Uh, why don't we dive into our first topic? Uh, Dara, if you could advance the slide just one. I think this, this uh, chart from Bloomberg pretty much speaks for itself. Uh, volatility is very much here and doesn't seem to be going away soon, uh, reflecting on the fact that the S&P has swung so wildly over the past year or so. You know, during these volatile times, it's very easy for investors to get spooked and really to begin to question their, their long-term investment strategies. So I'd love to hear from the panel, you know, starting with, uh, let's say, Ross here. What have you observed? You know, how are you and your teams really helping clients, whether it be with those traditional approaches or alternative strategies? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I mean, like I said, we have a, a wide range of solutions across asset classes. So in terms of mechanisms for delivering income to clients, we, we cover a wide range of products and, and asset classes. Um, what I think has been really interesting in the current environment, among many things, certainly is that um, we've kind of been, become accustomed to equity market volatility over the last few years in the pandemic. I mean, obviously 2020 uh, was the ultimate, hopefully, roller coaster in terms of equity volatility. And then um, more recently, we've seen quite a bit of choppiness uh, related to the growth sell-off since the Fed pivot uh, late last year has caused a lot of longer duration, high multiple growth stocks to sell off quite meaningfully. And we've, we've kind of experienced a lot of that equity volatility. But what I think is, is fairly unique to the current recent environment is the amount of volatility that we've seen within the fixed income landscape, um, which we really haven't been accustomed to. And I, I saw an interesting chart just the other day that um, two of the last five uh, we've had uh, of the five worst quarters for the Bloomberg U.S. Ag Bond Index going all the way back to 1980, two of those five worst quarters have actually happened in the last year plus. So Q1 of 2021, the ag was down a little over 3.3%. And then Q1 of this year, the ag was down almost 6%. Um, and so we've seen all this volatility in the fixed income space that we haven't seen for quite some time. Um, and then you combine that with the fact that we've also been experiencing rising correlations between stocks and bonds over the last few quarters. Um, and that's not something that's been unprecedented. We've observed periods in the past where stocks and bonds have displayed uh, positive correlation, particularly in areas like the 1990s. 
Um, but you add all that up, and I think what it's doing is it's it's really causing advisors and investors to wrestle with, um, you know, that sort of traditional 60-40 balanced portfolio, um, not only from the standpoint of is this meeting the income needs of my clients, but is this meeting the diversification needs uh, for my clients? Is this meeting the return potential uh, for, for my clients? And so, you know, maybe just I'll highlight a few um, areas that we've observed at Harbor with, with how advisors are trying to deal with that. Um, on the income side within the fixed income market, we see a lot of advisors that have just moved very short duration within their core fixed income. And I think, you know, intuitively, that makes a lot of sense. The view here is that, um, you know, the income and the yield potential at the nearer end of the curve is, is quite, a, quite similar to what we're seeing as you extend out along the yield curve. And so, you know, why should investors want to take that duration or interest rate risk uh, in the current environment, particularly just yesterday, you had, you know, some of the the more dovish Fed uh, members, Lael Brainerd, talking about accelerating uh, taper uh, and, and sort of aggressiveness in terms of Fed tightening. Um, the other thing that we see uh, occurring quite a bit is investors that are uh, stretching for yield and doing so in areas like, um, you know, the high yield space as well as the levered loan market. And I think, you know, that that also makes a lot of sense with where we've been in the economic cycle coming out of a, you know, sharp but very short correction in, in 2020 in the pandemic. Last year was a phenomenal year in terms of economic growth. This year, we're clearly decelerating from peak levels, but expectations are that the growth uh, engine is still humming along nicely. And so in those types of environments, um, you know, below investment grade fixed income has has typically delivered uh, a solid risk adjusted returns. Um, that being said, I mean, you, you know, we see some pockets of opportunity there. We see some areas where I think clients should proceed with some caution. Um, uh, again, just a, a couple quick examples. Within the high yield space, you know, a lot of investors are worried about spreads being particularly tight relative to history, and, and that's clearly the case. Um, but I think one of the things that investors potentially overlook is the improving credit quality that we have seen in the high yield market over the last several years. Um, just looking back a couple of years, the percentage of double Bs within the high yield market is has increased by about 15 percent and is now makes up more than half of the overall index. And so even when we have similar levels of spread vis-a-vis -a, -vis a few years ago, the credit quality is has improved materially. And so we see some pockets of opportunity for generating income in volatile markets in that venue. On the levered loan side, um, I think that would be an area where we would, uh, you know, suggest that investors should proceed with a little bit more caution, um, just in the sense that the amount of flows that have gone into that space have been astronomical. If, if you look at the Morningstar categories, there's about 134 Morningstar categories. Bank loan funds and ETFs have been the eighth best-selling category over the last year, taking in more than 50 billion in assets. And that, that just gets you a sense of how much advisors fear interest rate risk. They don't want duration risk. Um, but one of the things they should be mindful of in our view is that um, you know, below investment grade, whether it's high yield or levered loans, does come with significant credit risk. And um, you know, so as we navigate the Fed tightening, as we navigate a slowing economy, um, you know, if the Fed makes a policy mistake and throws us into a recession, you, you know, investors just need to be mindful about the credit risk that they're taking there with with an area like like bank loans. Just over last year, the average bank loan funds returned about two percent, um, and so you're not getting a huge upside for avoiding that interest rate risk. But if you look at the first couple months of the pandemic, levered loan funds were down, you know, twenty plus percent on average. And so there is a lot of downside risk, asymmetric risk there to keep in mind. And then lastly, before I pass the baton on to uh, some of my colleagues here, um, from a diversification standpoint, what we're seeing a lot of investors doing is, is really starting to think about, again, thinking about that hypothetical 60-40 balance portfolio with the concerns about bonds and stocks potentially being more positively correlated. Investors are thinking about adding other uh, asset classes that may display low levels of correlation to these main asset classes. And one area we're seeing a lot of interest in, and Joe can certainly speak to this probably much more than I can, is in the, the commodity space. 
Um, you know, obviously commodities are doing very well currently, just given the scarcity issues related to the emerging from the pandemic and the Ukraine uh, Russia war. Um, but I think what we've also observed is that commodities have been a useful diversifier across portfolios across multiple periods in history. And just to end with one, one fun fact, just in terms of the diversification benefit that commodities can provide. If you look at um, year to date, so just in the first quarter here, as you mentioned, Jay, equity volatility has been quite high. There's been a lot of choppiness. There's actually been 16 trading days where the S&P has had a return of minus 1% or worse. Across those 16 days, the Bloomberg Aggregate Bond Index has only had a positive return in six of those 16 days. Whereas if you looked at a broad diversified commodity index like the Bloomberg Commodity Index, it's had a positive return in 12 of those 16 days. And so there are other ways that I think we've observed investors are looking to add you know, sort of the zig to equity zag that helps to dampen uh, risk in, in these volatile markets. So I'll pause there and, um, you know, happy to, uh, to pass the baton. Fantastic overview, Ross. You know, I think it's a, a good natural segue to pass that baton to Joe, given the uniqueness of your business. We'd love to get your thoughts on this topic. Yeah, absolutely, Ross. That was the perfect segue. Um, so since I am in the alternative space, I, I have a little bit of that different perspective. Stock market volatility is inevitable. It happens all the time. Some years there's more volatility, some years there's less volatility. Um, but in general, bond market volatility has not occurred at the same time. So traditionally, investors have diversified out of the stock market by investing in the bond market. And this might be directly, this might be through ETFs, through mutual funds. The package doesn't matter so much, uh, but investors have had the diversification. So if stocks are going down, typically bonds will go up, right? The Fed will cut interest rates that will push bond prices up. Um, but this time is a little bit different because bonds are already, well, well, prior to the past few months, they were already at historically high levels because interest rates were at zero, right? So now in this bout of stock market volatility, we haven't seen that, seen that same level of price movement to the upside in bonds. And in fact, we've seen the opposite price movement to the downside in bonds. And this kind of points to the fact that stocks and bonds, they're not the only two games in town. Alternative investments are more important now than ever. You could make the argument in client portfolios to be able to hedge against volatility in both stocks and bonds at the same time, as we've seen so far throughout the first quarter of the year. So, this does include commodities, right? Certainly just being long commodities, long gold, um, or, or even long oil or agriculture commodities can help to provide diversification. But there are also more complex strategies within the, the commodity trading advisor space that can add similar levels of diversification with possibly a, a little bit better of a return than just outright holding the commodity. Um, so I, I'd encourage listeners of this webinar to maybe look into some of those different strategies. Um, I, I don't want to pitch myself, obviously, but finalize, we, we do partake in, in uh, those type of strategies in the futures markets to provide that diversification to clients who are looking to not be overly exposed to the stock market or overly exposed to the bond market. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Ross or Maggie, any, any accompanying thoughts and perspectives? I'm sorry, Marcel, that is. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I, I'd like to echo some of the things that, that, that Ross spoke about, but also um, differ with him on, on a few points. Certainly what we have seen from our, our client base and, and speaking to advisors and investors is really that um, this year you need to have some intentionality around your duration positioning. Um, as was mentioned, the ag was down about 6% in the first quarter. Um, I don't think anyone's calling for that to repeat for the rest of the year. But six times four is 24. And um, if we if we were to see another reprise of, of Q1, um, you know, it will be painful for investors who have traditional fixed rate uh, duration exposure. And so there needs to be intentionality around that because we've been in a very long uh, bond bull market. Um, and so we are having a lot of conversations with investors about reducing the duration profile of their portfolios unless they are uh, very intentionally you know tracking the ag or some type of other exposure 
Um, and there's quite a few ways to do that. You know, one thing to keep in mind is that for the first time in a long time, investors are going to be paid for holding cash or having ultra short exposures. Um, investors, you know, can, can actually allocate to T-bills for the first time and get returns above zero. Um, and then uh, on the floating rate note side, there are both investment grade floating rate note strategies that we offer as, as well as what Ross um, spoke about in terms of bank loans, also called senior loans or leveraged loans. Um, and, and those are below investment grade. Um, but all of those uh, floating rate notes or, or senior loans benefit from having these coupons that are resetting and resetting every, say, one to three months um, and, and seeing the benefit of higher LIBOR rates. LIBOR, three-month LIBOR recently crossed above 1% for the first time in, in several years. Um, and, and so they're harnessing these higher coupons and then they don't have that traditional duration risk, that interest rate sensitivity that most um, fixed rate securities in the bond market do have. Um, and then if you think about the forward trajectory of short rates and what the Fed has been announcing, um, there's probably close to another 2% of hikes in the near term that will come. And again, investors will benefit from those higher coupons as those coupons reset um, again every three months or so. Um, <clears throat> And then if you think about some of the volatility, uh, you know, as was mentioned, it is duration driven. So, um, you know, being able to mitigate some of that through, through, through various strategies um, uh, around reducing your duration is important. But also going into this year, we saw a lot of investors looking for high um, inflation adjusted or real uh, income strategies. And so we, we offer a number of those around such asset classes as high yield, preferreds, um, convertibles, and, uh, and uh, emerge, emerging market debt. So there are quite a few different levers that investors can, can use around a traditional high-grade core bond portfolio to increase income. And notwithstanding the fact that rates are higher uh, than they have been you know, in, the, in the recent past, uh, we, we do find that investors continue to be uh, starved for income and looking for a number of different diversifying um, income strategies. I'll pause there. Well, very much appreciate those inputs, uh, Marcel. I think it's it's a great jumping off point to to kind of weigh into our next topic and and how leaders are really navigating these market conditions, asset managers and advisors, and and what are those risks worth taking and those worth avoiding. So with that, you know, I'll pass that baton to to Maggie. Would love to get your thoughts on this topic. Sure. So I will come at this at, at the psychological or emotional piece of investing, right? Um, and maybe share some of the best practices that we use uh, with our clients as we go through these tumultuous markets. I think everyone on this call would agree that you want to have a well-diversified portfolio. I think my colleagues have already shared some interesting perspectives on at least on the fixed income side and on how to diversify. Um, but obviously that the same goes with uh, your equity side. Uh, what we do with our clients to keep them calm during these markets is remind them that it is time in the market and not timing the market and remind them that is why we work so diligently even through the good markets uh, to ensure that their asset allocation is indeed in line with their expectations with their risk tolerance so on and so forth one um, program that we implement and i i think it works very well with our clients is using a tool called Riskalyze. And the reason that I like it is because you input your client's portfolio and then you're able to show them historical scenarios of how their portfolio would perform, whether it's 2008 or 2013. And um, then we have some meaningful conversations. If another 2008-like scenario would occur, are they comfortable with their current asset allocation? Another tool that I like to use, and I'm sure everyone has seen this too, but again, it's very effective, is that sort of patchwork quilt uh, that many asset managers release, where it shows the, how different asset classes have performed over time. And I think it really drives home the fact that we don't know which asset class is going to do well next year. But we do know that a well-diversified portfolio, while it may never be the winner, it usually is also not the loser in any given year. So those are sort of our best practices. Um, I think it now more than ever is an important time to look over folks' asset allocation. Um, as my colleagues mentioned, uh, the, the economy is and the markets are still 
poised to do well due to some fundamentals, but we don't know how um, interest rates as they rise, how that's going to impact uh, the markets. It can sort of go either way, what mo is what most analysts say. And I know that's a topic we'll be covering. So it is important now to prepare clients emotionally for the volatility that is going to continue. Um, another thing that I remind clients of is that often the market recovers faster than the economy does or faster than uh, consumer sentiment believes the economy is recovering. Vanguard has a great piece which really sh uh, shows to not believe the headlines and it, and it indicates uh, several really you know, bad headlines about unemployment, about the housing crisis, all throughout the market recovery. And if clients had waited until the headlines are rosy, they would have missed out on about two years of growth in, in those situations. So um, another, another example that I like to cite is literally what just happened in 2020, right? Uh, had any client pulled out on the one worst of the market, which was I think March 16th, the S&P 500 fell that one day by 12%. Um, by March 23rd, the S&P hit rock bottom uh, at 34% uh, since uh, uh, February. And so if any investors had panicked during that time um, and then pulled money into the cash, they would have missed one of the best market days, not only in the year, but in, in all time. I believe the Dow, um, it was said that on April 9th, performance of the Dow was one of the top 10 uh, in history. Uh, uh, again, on April 9th, 2020, according to, to FactSet. So they would, most investors, had they pulled out during that bottom, they likely were not ready to come back in two weeks later, three weeks later, and they would have missed some of that great upside. And then, of course, the last resource I always like to sh uh, uh, coach my clients with is, again, many folks on this call probably know, but a nice reminder, is many of, of the examples of how a well-diversified portfolio that doesn't pull out of the market, that rides through the good and the bad times, how it tends to do better than if someone misses just the 10 best days, the 20 best days, so on and so forth. So again, now's a very good time to be thinking about risk, to be thinking about clients' goals, and also to um, be making those changes now as markets hopefully stabilize versus ahead of any sort or, or, or um, in, after any sort of recession. So with that, I'll turn it over back to my colleagues. Great commentary. Thank you, Maggie. Ross, I'd love to get your thoughts here. Yeah, I mean, I um, I really like uh, Marcel, your comment around intentionality uh, related to duration strategy. And I think as it relates to the topic here of, of what risks are worth taking and what risks are worth avoiding, I think intentionality is really important as well uh, in this environment. And I think what we would stress is that um, you know you'd want to be taking risks that uh, help protect the purchasing power of your income and your income needs, um, as well as potentially taking risks that help to ensure proper diversification from a risk management standpoint. So those are those are two areas that are not um, you know tactical type orientations, but more around ensuring that your long term. Uh, strategic asset allocation decisions related to goals and risk tolerance are in alignment because one of the things that we have observed is that volatility in markets can really swing things around materially. And if you're not keeping an eye on on your positioning, uh, things can get a little bit out of balance. And so, you know, one one area where we would, um, you know, suggest is a is a reasonable way to protect the purchasing power of income needs, a little bit different from the, the fixed income discussions that we've had, but more on the equity side is um, the utility around dividend and dividend growth strategies in this type of an environment. Um, you know, there are a lot of strategies out there, a lot of companies that are, um, you know, fairly uh, less sensitive to the economic cycle in terms of their ability to raise dividends consistently over a long period of time. So that provide some potential defensiveness from those equities in choppy markets, but it also provides a, a, a useful inflation hedge where we haven't, as investors, had to really think about inflation risk in most of our uh, careers or investment lifetimes. There are a lot of companies that have had the ability to grow their dividends faster than the rate of inflation, even in a year like 2021 where inflation, you know, as we all know, clearly accelerated to the upside. 
Um, the other benefit for dividend income uh, oriented strategies is that many of these companies are kind of stable, steady growth businesses that didn't uh, experience a lot of the rapid multiple expansion that we saw in that fastest growth, highest multiple cohort of the growth universe that's really been self-correcting since the Fed's been tightening. And so we see that as a as a useful area to maybe uh, make some tactical adjustments in terms of protecting that income purchasing power. In terms of um, you know taking steps to ensure proper diversification, I think this is 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 really just the the simplistic. Um, uh, taking a look at client portfolios and, and making sure that you haven't drifted materially either in terms of equity fixed income allocation, but more importantly, probably within the equity sleeve, that kind of growth versus value dynamic. Um, up until recently, um, you know, growth was on a multi-year run versus value investing. And I remember, you know, before Q1 of last year, there were a lot of media articles talking about value being dead again. And, and you know, since then we've seen quite a bit of a rotation. Um, and, and you could even make the argument a lot of you know style is is in the eye of the beholder. There's a subjectivity to it. Um, but you could make the argument that a lot of our most well-known core benchmarks, like the S and P 500, have become much more growthy over time. Uh, there's really no release valve for companies migrating out of the S and P 500, and so you have this rising concentration of mega cap growth oriented companies. Um, and so I think, you know, with that, ensuring that there's a balance is, is useful. Um, value and growth stocks uh, displayed very low levels of correlation last year and into this year. And I think one of the additional benefits of value stocks today is that, um, you know, they haven't been particularly correlated with, with bonds uh, this year. And so what a lot of people are talking about is rising correlation risk between the S&P 500 and the Bloomberg Act. Um, but areas like the Russell 1000 value have continued to display that negative correlation. And so, um, you know, that's an area that I think, you know, can help investors maintain that proper diversification, dampen some risk amidst volatility. And then the last, um, the last kicker uh, related to value stocks in terms of their utility uh, related to, you know, the overarching topic of this webinar, income needs, is that value stocks are, are offering a, a, a higher level of dividend yield relative to the S&P 500, certainly relative to the growth universe. And so that can be a way to add some incremental yield as well. Um, in addition to having a little bit more of a margin of safety, um, you know, margin of safety has always been a, a key component of value investing that really kind of went out the window in the early stage of the pandemic, almost coincidentally, because a lot of the companies in the value index just happened to be companies that really were hard hit from global lockdowns. Uh, and so, um, you know, those are a couple areas we would we would suggest it uh, makes some sense to introduce potentially some risk. Uh, I would say some areas to avoid would just be, you know, I, as I mentioned, um, you know, not not sort of bank loans or high yield in general, but the the more um, lower rated areas of those marketplaces in a decelerating economy. Um, you never know what is going to crack first, and so I think they're they're. Um, Investors will benefit for having a focus on quality in some of these riskier areas of the marketplace. And then, you know, this may sound a little self-serving, but I think an area to avoid is, is being overly passive, um, you know, particularly in the equity sphere. Uh, I, I think conventional wisdom is, has been that, you know, you want to go passive in large cap U.S. equities and go active in less efficient areas like international small cap or U.S. small cap or emerging market equities. And, you know, if, if the pandemic's shown us anything, you know, 2020 was a banner year for active managers in areas like U.S. large blend, U.S. large growth. Um, and so, you know, particularly given some of the concentration risk we're seeing that's really been building up in some of these large cap indices, we look at this as an opportunity to not be tethered to some of these growing risks that might be that, that investors might be a little bit less aware of when they're passive investing, thinking that they're getting very, very broad diversification, where in fact, some of that diversification has become more concentrated uh, over the last few years. Jay, if I could, if I could just chime in as well, I Please. think you might be on mute. Um, you know, one thing, one thing that, that Ross brought up, and I'm going to speak um, a little bit out of turn here because I do, I do focus on fixed income, but I know that we have a strategy of fund that really, um, 
concentrates the portfolio around something called dividend aristocrats. And these are companies that have grown their dividend uh, consistently over the last 20 years. Um, and, and again, it's a little bit out of my wheelhouse, but I do want to echo, I, I know that's a popular strategy and, it, and it's a strategy that could make a lot of sense in this type of environment. Excellent. Great insight. Thank you, uh, thank you both Ross and Marcel. Before we turn over to our next topic, just want to remind the audience that we welcome the interactivity. If you'd like to throw a question or two into the chat box, by all means, we're, we're here to answer them and, and very pleasantly surprised by the cross section of the audience as well. People from E-Trade, people from Fidelity and a, an array of RIA. So thank you all for, for attending today. Switching gears uh, to the next topic, um, and that is how can clients take comfort in the past amidst this geopolitical instability? It's certainly nothing pleasing to watch what's going on in, in Ukraine. Uh, however, you know, it is important to note that, you know, market corrections are pullbacks are cyclical. They're common. And in fact, I was just reading a recent Forbes article that mentioned since 1928, uh, a correction of at least 10% uh, has happened in the S&P about once every 19 months. So, uh, Amidst this this tumultuous times, how do you how do you coach clients to take comfort in the past? Maggie, why don't we start with you? We'd love to hear your thoughts. Sure. Uh, I think, as you said, you always have to remind clients of the past doesn't necessarily predict the future, but uh, we I think clients can get comfort from situations that were similar. And how did the markets react in those situations? So there was uh, some really great research put out by LPL right after um, this occurred. It was called 11 Things to Know About, about Russia and Ukraine. And um, they looked at 37 major geopolitical events since World War II. And they showed how the markets reacted after each geopolitical event, one month, three months, six months, and 12 months. And so long as the um, economy or the markets were not posed for a recession when that event occurred, which again, we could argue that the our economy was not uh, poised for a recession, right? We were just coming out of one. A lot of economic, economic fundamentals are quite strong uh, currently. So long as we're not poised for a recession, t we have seen an average uh, recovery 12 months later from a geopolitical event like Russia invading Ukraine uh, of an average of 10.8%. So I think, again, the past can't predict the future, but seeing that and pointing out to all of these different events that are quite similar to what's going on now, because geopolitical events have always occurred and unfortunately will continue to occur, I think is one place to really provide comfort to, to clients. You know, the other thing that I, I, I always hesitate to say, just because I don't believe that war is ever the answer, just given the human cost, you know, government spending is a key component of GDP, right? Um, and so typically when wars occur, it increases government spending and therefore increases economic growth. For example, large cap stocks during World War II returned an average of about 16.9% uh, during the Gulf War, large cap stocks were 11.7%. Um, similarly, small cap stocks, World War II, almost 33%. So markets do tend to do well during times of war. And by the way, in both of those examples, inflation was elevated as well. Certainly not where it is now, but during World War II, inflation averaged 5.2%, for example. So I think that really helps many clients remember that we've been here in the past. And ultimately, uh, while, uh, you know, make no mistake, these sorts of events do cause a lot of volatility in the short term, but in the long term, the overall impact of geopolitical events on uh, markets tends to be um, not as impactful as maybe we're feeling in a given moment. You know, furthermore, looking at this uh, particular situation, right, uh, we can all probably agree here that oil markets and were, were primarily impacted when it comes to, to markets. Um, and you know we we are uh, happy to to say that the U.S. doesn't really rely significantly on Russian oil in the way that Europe does, and that kind of goes back to our diversification, right? You don't want to be all in European countries because now that you'd be hurting pretty significantly. So I think looking at the past and just reminding clients uh, of situations that were similar is very helpful. 
Very insightful. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, Marcel, we'll throw it back to you. Your thoughts. Yeah, Jay, I'm going to approach this from a slightly different angle. Um, you know, one of the things that um, I, I find is, is paramount in, in these types of environments is, is to know what you own. And, um, you know, one of the benefits of the ETF wrapper and certainly for our fund lineup is that we publish all of the holdings of all of our funds every day on our website and our, uh, on our website and our third, third party distributors as well. <clears throat> and so, you know, when when Russia invaded, um, I think there were certainly some client questions, but they, they tended to gravitate around um, our bond funds that are global or emerging market in orientation. And certainly we had some um, exposure to Russia uh, and, and, and some of the other uh, countries in that region in our emerging market debt strategies, perhaps in, our, some of, in, in some of our global bond funds. But these tend to be index strategies, very transparent, and you know what you own. Um, and, and you can see your holdings every day. Uh, on the flip side, there were some headlines out there for some uh, mutual fund managers that um, investors may, may have been surprised to know that they had significant uh, exposure to Russia. In fact, there was one, one, one um, manager out there who was selling uh, credit default protection, insurance protection to Russia. And so it really just comes down to knowing what you own, having that transparency, um, being able to have very sort of targeted exposures. So if you want to allocate to emerging market debt, um, you can do so uh, through this ETF wrapper, through a strategy that is dedicated, um, you know, through a fund that is dedicated to that strategy and not sort of mingled in with a number of other exposures. Um, and then for some clients, we, you know, we, we do have active strategies where, again, they can um, you know, leverage the, 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 the knowledge and acumen uh, uh, of, a, of a brand name. Um, sub-advisor, uh, but it really, you know, it really comes down to knowing what you own and, and being comfortable and intentional about your exposures. Fantastic. Well, you know, that, that leads us to our, our final topic today. And uh, it was just roughly a week ago that we had the first Fed rate hike since 2018. And it's one of anticipated more to come in the coming weeks and months. So with that said, you know, I'd like to perhaps start with Maggie here. Your thoughts about the scenarios and outcomes for future anticipated hikes and that balance sheet unwind. Sure. Um, so I think, uh, you know, it, we shouldn't be seeing anything that's surprising necessarily at this time. Uh, I think the Fed has tried to be very transparent about their rake hikes, and we saw a lot of that priced in, you know, this January um, when we already knew the, the Fed was going to increase rates. Um, many folks that I spoke to, many analysts believed back in January, those hikes were going to be even more than now. I think the latest number I heard was seven. Uh, in January, some people were saying nine. Um, and, and so obviously we don't know, no one ever knows exactly that number, and I'm not going to sit here and pretend I have that crystal ball. But um, I think as all of our colleagues on this call have said, we wanna make sure you understand what you own um, and that your bonds and your fixed income is po uh, is positioned correctly for these rate hikes. So uh, I know many folks had um, invested in floating rate at, at you know maybe a little bit earlier in the year, um, which could protect as interest rates are increasing. So uh, I'll. Rough. Yeah, maybe Jay. Yeah, yeah. Marcel, please. Yeah, sure. So maybe maybe just a quick recap of uh, you know what where where the Fed is at at this point in the cycle and kind of what we're what we're seeing and what what they've done um, and and there's news coming out every day on this. So um, you know if you go back to June, you know basically nine nine months or so ago, um, the Fed itself was not anticipating any rate hikes in 2022, and that's pretty remarkable because over the course of the last nine months, uh, the pivot has been very dramatic. Um, certainly, um, I don't want to call it unprecedented, but atypical of what, you know, most, most folks who are investing today have ever seen in, in, in their, in their lifetimes. Um, and so now you have a fed that, um, actually I remember back in January, Goldman Sachs called for five rate hikes, uh, for 2022. And at the time that seemed like quite a few. Um, and now we've had one hike, where the Fed minutes were released yesterday and they said they actually would have liked to do 50 basis points at that height, but they were a little bit concerned about, you know, how the market would react to that in, in the face of the geopolitical conflict. 
Um, major banks such as uh, Citigroup and JP Morgan are now um, calling for 50 basis points at each of the uh, next two meetings. Um, Citigroup, in fact, is calling for 50 basis point at 50 basis points at each of the next four meetings. Um, and the 50 basis point hike, I think, has over 90% um, expectation right now for the next meeting. So certainly, you know, I, I think we should expect 50 bips at the, at the next hike. Um, and then, and then subsequent hikes later in the year, maybe smaller, maybe 25, and then, and then more to come in, in 2023. And then also yesterday, an announcement that um, the Fed is looking to, you know, once they begin a, a roll off, a runoff of the, of the balance sheet, and over the course of say three months, um, get to a, a cap of $95 billion of securities um, split maybe two thirds, one thirds between treasuries and mortgages um, in terms of runoff. Um, because they have now have a $9 trillion balance sheet and, and they need to shrink that. Um, and so we were talking about volatility at the beginning of the call. And I think this ties back well, because we have seen elevated interest rate volatility, uh, multi-year highs. Um, and the Fed is effectively saying that, you know, before too long, they're going to remove themselves um, from, the mor from the mortgage market. Um, and so now for some years, we've seen a uh, price insensitive, indiscriminate buyer in these securities. Uh, the Fed has just come out every month and bought fixed income securities. They don't care what the price is. They're just there to support the market. Um, and now they're, they, you know, they may come to a point where they'll be selling mortgage securities, although they haven't said that just yet. But certainly they're going to stop buying them altogether, um, probably before the end of the year. Um, and that's only going to, to probably lead to more volatility. Um, <clears throat> because again, they, they have a very supportive um, role in, in, in when they were engaging in uh, quantitative easing. Um, so, so the, the other thing to keep in mind is that the last time that the Fed um, paused in their purchases, which they really just finished last month, the purchases that they had, they had been scheduled with the last $20 billion, um, they held that balance sheet stable for quite a long time. Uh, they waited quite a long time before hiking. Um, and now they really find themselves behind, behind the, the curve here late to the game. Um, so quickly after they've stopped purchases, they went and hiked, and, and it seems like only a few months later they want to run off um, this balance sheet. So this is very unprecedented. It's, it's the removal of a tremendous amount of stimulus, um, but obviously they're concerned about inflation. They see that the jobs picture is quite strong, and they have to keep that dual mandate in mind. Um, but investors are certainly, as we talked about at the beginning, losing money and because of higher interest rates. Um, but also presented with some opportunities. Like I said earlier, um, cash, you know, it pays you for the first time. So whether that's an ultra short exposure um, or, or, or T-bill exposure or something with extremely low duration, less than a third of a year, like floating rate note exposure, there are many ways um, to, to position around this. Fantastic recap, Marcel. Um, with a minute or two left before we open it up to audience questions, Joe uh, or Ross, any any. Perhaps, Joe, uh, we'd love to hear from you again. Any any closing thoughts on this topic? Yeah, so what we've seen the past couple of years in terms of monetary policy is something that we certainly haven't seen since, at, at least within the 21st century, you could possibly go back even further. And this time it's a little bit different, too, because prior to maybe the late 90s, electronic trading wasn't, wasn't really a thing. So markets are very different today than they were back then for that reason. And what we saw in uh, 2020 with essentially QE infinity by the Fed, um, cutting interest rates to zero and, and massive asset purchase programs is we saw all asset classes surge, right? Um, and, and this is in large part due to the fact that there's more, more dollars chasing fewer goods, right? So I, I went to University of Chicago and uh, Milton Friedman, the, the, one of the most prominent economists of all time, uh, he's a professor at University of Chicago. He has a famous quote that inflation is everywhere and always a monetary phenomenon. Um, so there, there are competing theories, of course. But with so many more dollars in circulation, all sorts of various asset classes rose together. And I bring this up because today the Fed is, in some sense, undoing part of their mistake of 2020 of, of maybe going a little bit too 
hog wild on the monetary stimulus. They're starting to pull that back. They're starting to raise interest rates. And uh, there's talk just uh, just yesterday about starting to let the balance sheet run off. So shrinking the balance sheet, essentially removing some of those dollars from circulation that they printed will be the net effect of this. And that could lead us to a situation where just two years ago, all asset classes rose together. We might see a situation now where all asset classes fall together, or maybe not necessarily fall, but their, their growth growth will be muted across a variety of asset classes. So I, I think that's why it's important to take a look at alternative investments, because there are investments out there that can still do well and profit, even if asset classes as a whole are not rising, right? So, so short-term trading strategies like what Finalize does, and there's plenty of other firms that do it too, uh, we're agnostic to the overall direction of the market. So we didn't really benefit from the overall mm -hmm. rise in asset classes. And um, we, likewise, we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't suffer from an overall fall in asset classes. So just another thing to keep in mind for the attendance of this webinar, to keep in mind that monetary policy, because it's so extreme today, we could have large scale movements across all asset classes, and you might have to work a little bit harder to get diversification than you did in the past. Makes good sense. And very, Jay, very just one thing, one thing Please. that I'll just close with, I, I think, um, you know, one of the things I think this um, should potentially serve as a, a cautionary reminder to advisors or investors is that, you know, even the experts, the Fed and, and others do a pretty terrible job of trying to forecast uh, interest rate movements. And ultimately, the interesting thing is that, you know, in the, the past several years, the Fed has said, you know, we, we don't really know where rates are going. We're going to just chase our tail, but we're going to be really transparent about what we're going to do as we kind of chase our tail. And so I think one of the things that that potentially lends itself to is, um, you know, within a core fixed income exposure, not to be very fearful of duration neutral strategies, those strategies that just try to take the interest rate macro guess game out of the picture and just focus on bottom-up security selection where a, a manager might have some value to add. And, and one other, um, you know, sort of data point that I'll just close with related to that is that, you know, again, history is not necessarily a, a forecast of the future, but because the Fed has been so transparent for the last several years, if you look at the last two Fed rate hike cycles back between 04 and 06 and then 2015 to uh, 20, uh, 2019, once the Fed lifted off, if you then looked at what happened to yields across the yield curve from the one year to the two year to the five year, 10, 30, there was very little upward movement at the 10 year and the 30 year. And in fact, in both of those cycles, you, you actually had flat or sometimes declining yields at the long end of the curve because of the fact that markets tend to anticipate, especially when they're being told by a Fed, this is what we're planning to do, planning to tighten. And so I think just as something for investors to keep in mind, because again, you do see a lot of fear around interest rate risk being one of the biggest fears that investors are, are, are talking about. Um, but coincidentally, the last two times the Fed hiked at the front end of the curve, all of that yield increase of the majority happened at the front end, not the long end. And if you look at different categories, short term, intermediate term and long term categories, it was actually long-term bonds that did the best during that actual Fed hike cycle. And so, again, just a, a little bit of a food for thought in terms of maybe not trying to be a hero in terms of tactical interest rate decisions. Good, good points. Thank you so much, Ross. You know, as, as per usual at the, the last few minutes, the questions from the audience are trickling in. And so uh, I want to take the next three or four minutes to answer those while at the same time giving Dara some time to talk about the CE credits that are available for the attendees today. Uh, two questions that just popped in. One, and perhaps Joe, you might be well suited for this. What alternatives do you think will perform the best? And the subsequent question, time permitting, uh, one audience member, Mike, mentioned that we haven't heard too much about muni bonds or closed end funds. Are the, either of those attractive in this environment? And do you recommend them and why? favorites, perhaps. Why don't we start with alternatives? Yeah. So uh, what we've seen over the course of the past year is commodities have been the best performing alternative. So a lot of that was due to supply chain disruptions. And then that was most recently exacerbated 
due to the, the conflict in, in uh, Ukraine and the resulting sanctions. So what's interesting about the alternative space is it's very broad, right? It, it's hard to put all alternatives under the same umbrella. So um, some alternatives do have a strong correlation to the overall economy and, and to the stock market. Um, real estate would be a, a good example of that. Uh, real estate, in some sense, being even correlated to interest rates, because as interest rates rise, mortgage rates go up, and, and that's a, a negative pressure on real estate prices. So, and then you have venture capital and, and private equity, which are, are kind of like stock investments, just with smaller companies, right? Um, whereas commodities, it, it's a lot more of a, a separate animal altogether. And then going even further than that, if you're looking at algorithmic trading strategies that don't have any sort of directional bias, um, th that's where you can get a lot, a lot more uh, correlation and diversification. No one knows which one's going to do best moving forward, right? No one has a crystal ball. Um, but diversification and trying to find uncorrelated investments, this is a, a tried and true uh, method in, in finance that has worked for a long time. And everyone sort of agrees will continue to work moving forward. Thanks for that, Joe. Appreciate it. Um, with two minutes or less, uh, would anybody like to field a question regarding muni bonds or closed-end funds? Are either of those attractive in this environment? Do you recommend them? Favorites, perhaps? I, I could chime in on, on munis. Um, you know, certainly munis do have a place in the portfolio of um, investors who have tax considerations. And what we have seen this year is that, um, as with all, nearly all other fixed um, income or fixed coupon investments, they've also been hit. And um, all curve muni strategies are probably down six or seven percent year to date. Now, typically, investors should not be. Um, looking at munis as a capital appreciation play, but more as a tax-free um, income you know, and uh, alternative. And so, um, you know, if you are allocating to munis today, you will be getting higher um, tax, uh, you'll be getting higher income rates, higher yields and higher tax, um, tax adjusted yields. Um, but you have to bear in mind that if interest rates continue to rise, um, you may you may lose uh, more price there. And so uh, I think, again, there needs to be some intentionality. If you uh, don't have conviction about the level of interest rates, if you are concerned about interest rates going higher, then you can allocate to shorter duration, shorter maturity uni instruments. Um, but but it may be a good entry point um, today when when the long longer uh, duration munis are down six or seven percent to allocate if you've been underweight to that sector. Um, but but you also have to remember that duration remains one of your key risks in, in munis. Great guidance, Marcel. Thank you so much. You know, as we near the close here, I want to take a minute to thank not only our panelists, but all the audience members and the great cross section we had. I just noticed a few more friends from LPL and John Hancock. Um, really impressed by the diversity of the attendees, as well as the uh, the makeup of the panelists. Um, next month, we'll have yet another uh, edition in our webinar series. Uh, I believe this next one's going to focus on bolstering uh, stickiness and engagement with your audiences and uh, those advisors and asset managers that are doing it well. Uh, with that said, um, thank you so much, everybody, for attending today. I'm going to pass the baton back back to Dara so she can just have some closing commentary if she wants to sh share that slide on continuing education credits. Sure. So I, I just want to say thank you to the panel because this was really a phenomenal session and really very educational. Um, just gonna get that last slide up there just to make sure anyone who's seeking the CE credit for your CIMA, CPWA, CIMC, RMA, or CFP certifications, just please make sure if you haven't done so already to provide your credentials and institute ID number to CE at dwealth.education. Uh, but thank you again. It was really, really insightful panel. A lot of great, great nuggets of information in there. Well, wishing everybody a great close to the Thursday and stay tuned for the next edition of Digital Wealth News and Clout by Tiffin's webinar series. Thank you all. Thank Have you. Thanks everyone for attending. Thank